Hey everyone, how's it going? You know, uh, welcome to, <laughs> you know, you know, welcome to Know Your Gear uh, QA Live podcast, uh, the European edition. Uh, I don't know why I'm calling it European edition. Uh, what happened was um, a, a few of my patrons had mentioned that, uh, you know, that the time frame in which I do the live shows is not, uh, you know, very cool or not. I don't want to say they didn't say it was cool. They said it wasn't great for uh, the later time zones like in Europe. And funny thing is, uh, the reason the show is at three o'clock my time, 3 p.m. Uh, on Fridays is because I needed a time uh, time frame so that if my wife was not able to get my daughter from school, I could do it. And uh, because of COVID, my daughter's been homeschooling. So I thought to myself, uh, I think yesterday or day before, I thought, why am I always doing it at the same time? Although I, I like doing it at time because it's like a gathering spot. I'm not going to stop doing that. But I said, why don't I mix it up every once in a while and, and do some other time zones and see if there's other other people from the community jump on and, and we get to talk and, and hang out. So I thought it'd be fun. So that's what this is today. If you're new to this live show, a couple things to know. You got to start a question or a, uh, or if you want to try to start a subject, do a question mark first. That way I know you're talking to me. And also, if you're watching the rebroadcast, I take the time to timestamp everything, everything that we said. And then usually whatever we talk about the longest or what's the most interesting, which is usually the same thing, uh, I put that as the uh, uh, the click title, <laughs> if you will. Sometimes we get lucky with it. Sometimes we don't. Uh, and uh, and it's pretty cool. This week I have been crazy, crazy busy. And I had a funny story. I want to start with a funny story that happened to me yesterday. So um, I finished up about six videos this week. Uh, I was doing a lot of editing this week because that's what it is. I film the stuff and then I got to sit and edit it. So I edited up about six videos. I was sharing them with the patrons. And one of the videos uh, was to the new... Uh, relentless pickups that Billy Sheehan had uh, developed with uh, DiMarzio pickups, and they are freaking amazing. So <laughs> what happened was uh, Wilson at DiMarzio sent me a nice email just saying, hey, how's everything going? What you up to? And I said, oh, I, I finished a video for your bass pickups. I have some cool DiMarzio guitar pickups I'm working on too, uh, video. And I sent him a link and, uh, and I, you know, so obviously the patrons are seeing it and he sees it and I'm sure he's going to share it with Larry, which he did. And they shared it with Billy Sheehan, which I didn't know, by the way. And so what happened was I went back, I'm editing the next video and I look over and there's like 350 views on the video. And I think well, that's odd because there's like only 350 patrons. So every single patron watched this video that's never happened before. Right. And then I look at the comments. And one of the comments is, comments is Billy Sheehan sent me here. And I'm like, this seems different. What's going on? So I looked and that's what happened. So uh, Wilson sh shared it with Larry. Larry shared it with Billy and uh, and Billy put it on his Facebook. <laughs> So, uh, you know what I decided when Billy Sheehan uh, shares your video, it goes public. So I switched it to public and I let everybody see the video. So, uh, which is interesting only because the video I used is, uh, when I say I share them with patrons, the patrons get, uh, what I call the preview video. It's usually, uh, in 720p, not 1080p. And it's usually, uh, missing some of the final edits because I want to see if they have suggestions or if they've caught things like, Hey, you misspelled this or Hey, this, this didn't make sense or you said this backwards, things like that you catch. That's the downfall of being uh, when you make YouTube videos is you're doing the, you know, you, you do the concept, you film it, then you edit it, you're producing it. It's a lot of hats to wear. And depending on your mindset of that day and the other things I got to do, sometimes things get through. So I just thought that was cool. I, I mean, it was like made my week. Obviously he liked it, which was good. It's always nice uh, when the person who developed the product he reviewed enjoyed the video and um, that was really cool. So uh, again, I was a little nervous about it. <laughs> so there you go. That was my, that's my cool story for the week. Other than that, I'm just being working tomorrow. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow, but if it's not Friday, it's Saturday for sure. I'll just, uh, but, but it will be, depends on what I decide. You know what I mean? Um, uh, will be the part three, the final of my super strat build. And, um, and that chimes in because somebody, and I, I know I usually get to the first question, I'll get there. But uh, one, of the, um, one of the questions I got was, I saw it, I'm sorry, I should have just pinned it or grabbed it somehow. Somebody was asking me about super strats. 
And it was only funny timing because somebody made a comment on a video today that the super strat I'm building is not a super strat because it doesn't have a Floyd Rose. And then the question today lined up with that, which is what constitutes, uh, I can't find it. Uh, I apologize. I can't find the question, but I promise I got the, I got the just, the just is what, what makes a super strat a super strat? They were asking if is, is, uh, HSS, a humbucker, humbucker, or a humbucker, single, single, does it have a Floyd? To me, a super strat originally would be uh, what Eddie Van Halen did, which is a humbucker and then uh, a locking tremolo. That would be, in my mind, uh, what I perceive as when people say super strats, especially 80s super strat. When, I, when somebody says 80s super strat, again, this isn't stuff you can, you know, you can look it up on Wikipedia, but there's no real true definition because everybody's going to have a different perspective. To me, if somebody said 80 Super Strat, obviously I think of Charvels. You know what I mean? Uh, but also Fenders. Fenders did the heavy metal strats. Same thing. Anything that is a Strat body shape with a tremolo, uh, which obviously Strat has a tremolo, but, um, uh, but humbuckers or humbucker single single. Either way, that's the real thing. And usually, and this is where, again, everybody's going to have different definition. Yeah, if I think 80s Super Strat, I'm definitely thinking of Floyd Rose. However, more than a Floyd Rose, I think of Super Strats as being three major criteria for myself. One, it has at least one humbucker, usually in the bridge. Two, and that could be a mini humbucker too, by the way. Uh, two, it has a tremolo that doesn't go out of tune. Now, whether that be locking or what have you, um, when somebody said today, I want to comment some videos that if it doesn't have a Floyd, it's not a true super strat. I'm like, well, sir makes super strats and they make them without Floyds. I mean, we've learned a lot since the eighties. We've learned how to keep guitars in tune and not everyone is dive bombing and really believe it or not, the Floyd Rose is really helpful for a lot of things, but it's really great at the dive bomb thing. Uh, and, and then the third criteria of a super strat for me is a faster neck. And uh, I love it. Uh, faster neck to me means thinner, thinner neck, uh, usually flatter radius fretboard too. So again, usually if somebody said like, a, a, for example, if somebody said I took a Fender Strat and made a Super Strat out of it, I would think that they flattened the fretboard radius to be a little faster, Put usually put jumbo frets on it as another thing that Super Strats were known for, um, or medium jumbo frets. Uh, thin down the neck a little bit so it plays a little little faster when i say faster the thinner the neck the more it changes the way your hand grabs the neck you tend to if you haven't experienced this if you're going to a music store and pick up some guitars you ever pick up a big chunky neck and you just want to play some big chords and maybe some blues bins and it feels really good and then you pick up one of those wizard shredder necks and all you want to do is scales even if you're i'm not a lead player at all and all i do is scales when i pick up those guitars so it, it is it's not psychologically the shape of the guitar it's that neck uh, and then, of course, like I said, the humbuckers. So to me, a super strat is those things. It's basically basically converting a standard Fender Stratocaster or Stratocaster to more of a virtual, virtuoso kind of lead playing guitar. So those are my definitions of it in my mind. And that's what I look for. So that's what mine is. And so, you know, I thought about putting a Floyd Rose in my super strat. And um, I actually built two. Some of you guys know that. Some people who follow me on Instagram and definitely the patrons know that the videos you're seeing, the one part one, part two, and now part three is coming uh, of my Super Strat build. Uh, there's actually two Super Strats being built. I'm building them simultaneously and fil filming them simultaneously. So um, because I wasn't sure what to do, and that's something I've decided to do uh, now, is one of the problems I have in the past is I film stuff and then something goes wrong and I don't have a video for you guys. So like in the movies where they have like stunt cars and backup cars and backup things. I'm learning now when I do videos of this nature, since it's not just a review, it's something that's actually important because <laughs> if I'm tell if I'm doing part one to part three, I got to finish. Right. So I've been doing duplicate videos, uh, which is definitely doubling the work, but it is really cool. Cause in this case, um, one of the guitars came out amazing. I'm super happy. And one of the guitars came out. Okay. You know what I mean? So I'm going to share the okay with you second because I want to show the success one more so than the than the failure one. Uh, failure is a little st strict because I have a friend who said he loved it, so he didn't know what I was complaining about. Um, may, it's like when you paint a room, you see the mistakes, and everybody else is like, I love the color, and you're like, but what about that spot? <laughs> All right. Um, and I know I got some super chats. Please hold tight, guys, on the super chats. I promise to get to every single one of them. Um, I just want to grab a couple more of the early comments. 
uh, if they're still there. Sometimes they move around. All right. Uh, oh, Matt Bud, what a what a crazy interesting question uh, and great topic. Have I ever refused to do a mod on a guitar that I thought was morally wrong, i.e., route a vintage Strat for EMGs or something? Um, you know what's funny about that is uh, I, I I've never had to actually say no, like I won't do it. Okay. Um, cause there's a couple things. And if you guys are repair guys out there, or if you're in the, um, contract, I don't know what you call what I do contract workforce, like where basically you do, you bid jobs, essentially any kind of repairs, like any kind of uh, construction, anything like that, you're bidding jobs. People come in, there's certain things are flat rates, but when people start throwing scenarios at you, you got to work up a bid. And the best thing to do <laughs> is I feel horrible, but so, cause, so if you're a customer of mine and you've experienced this, I, I I'm being at least upfront with you. Uh, I never say no. I just come up with a, I don't want to do it price. I find that always seems to be effective. That's the, you come up with a price that makes them go, ah, it's not worth it. Or they'll go somewhere else. And that way you don't have to tell them no. And if they do accept that price, uh, well, maybe you're just like, you're going to make a, you know, a ton of killing. Um, but usually you can do that. You're like, Hey, if this is what you do, you know, uh, you can raise the prices a little bit. In other words, make the bid a little high. Out bid, bid yourself out of the job because it might be a headache. But that doesn't happen very often. Most things, unfortunately, I have a uh, my personality is I love a challenge. So every time I see something crazy, I'm like, oh yeah, let's do that. But funny story is, uh, uh, if you guys remember Ed Roman, he passed away. He had Roman's Guitars in Vegas. It was one of the largest music stores or guitar stores in the world. Uh, and uh, I I talked to him a few times before he passed away. Before I even opened my store, I went to Vegas with my wife and we talked to him because I went on a tour. I think I told you guys this. Before I opened my store in 2004, I went on a tour of places in California, Nevada, asking store owners what they thought, you know, what do they think? How do I do stuff? And uh, he was one of them. And he told me a story about during the eighties that they modded so many guitars because of Eddie Van Halen, so many strats, they turned so many vintage strats into super strats that he said as a joke, single-handedly, he probably ruined the vintage market. So uh, I understand. And he said, what's sad is he took all those vintage pickups and they threw them in dumpsters. So uh, it's a it was a crazy time. So yeah, there's a little bit of that. Morally, how I look at it is, if it's your guitar, it's yours. It's your money. You should be able to do whatever you want to it. H have I cringed? Yeah, I've cringed at a couple things I've done uh, for customers. Um, you know, but pleasantly, so you know, not very often, but every once in a while, when you do one of those weird ones, where you're like, I don't know why he's doing this, and I don't know why I'm doing it for him. You get to the end and you go, eh, it was way cooler than I thought. He had a better idea of it than I did, but um. Yeah, but that's an interesting question. No, so I've never said no to a, to anything that, you know, a modification that was crazy. Essentially, these are tools, and I understand it hurts to see the value of them destroyed. Um, but, you know, <laughs> the, the only thing to think about this, when somebody mods a, a vintage guitar, all they're doing is upping the value of all the other vintage guitars. <laughs> so um, I have, however... Uh, stop myself from doing modifications to certain guitars. Like I'm like, I just don't, you know, I, I want to do it because I really want it, but I'm afraid that I'll just be destroying the guitar forever value wise. Uh, uh, let's see. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, oh, let me, let me grab some super chats real quick just because they're kind of piling up on me. Hold on. And it's a good time to drink some water. I should have had coffee. It's so early. Well, not early, but earlier for me. All right. What do we got? We got Sarang. Hey, Sarang. He says, hey, Phil, uh, catching the show after quite a while. Awesome. Good to see you again. I'm planning on uh, staining a body for a build. What stuff should I be mindful of? What stains do you use? I'm currently using the Crimson Guitar Stains. Um, they're really vibrant. I like them. So uh, I, I, I thought I'd give them a try. They are very, very good. So, um, so those are the stains I've been using. Um, but I also, the, the guys at Crimson sent me all the stains. They sent me like, ah, like eight of them. It was really cool. Um, they did it just in case I needed it for the build. My guitar build for the great guitar build off was originally going to be the, the same color it is now the Atlantis, but it was going to be stained. The guitar was going to be stained those colors. That was the original concept of the guitar. Um, so 
that that's why I, I explained why I bleached the top. I bleached the top because I was going to stain it blue and green. Um, but anyways, I did a bunch of stains now with those, and I really like them. Uh, but keep in mind, when it comes to finish work, like I've said before, painting and staining, I am just not a that's not what I do uh, I'm more of a touch-up I can fix touch-ups I can do stuff like that you master kind of in the repair world how to fix a, a, a chip or a problem you know what I mean for a customer so they don't have to go through all the refinish work but anytime uh, you know I get stuff like that I need stuff like that I usually have sources for that other words other people who do what I do for a living and it's nice we can trade we can barter like I'll do some work for them they do some work for me and we can get it done for the customer but those are the ones I'm using I, I like I said really really like them uh, Jeff Parker says, I bought a new Jackson neck through neck painted to match the body has super glossy, sticky, poly clear. Uh, I love true oil. Can I mask off where the hand goes, scuff it up and then put a coat of true oil over the poly? You can. I would give you two other suggestions, though. First of all, you absolutely can score the base of the neck and then take and uh, lightly sand the neck to a satin finish. Um, if you were going to do that, if you want my suggestion, go online and look at uh, how some how Music Man does it, how uh, BC Rich has done it, how Schechter has done it. Schechter has a beautiful uh, neck through. It's a fake neck through, but it's a neck through looking guitars. The SLS series where they score. All they're doing is scoring i just did it for a customer but i scored his his uh paint job on the bot on the base of the neck and then i took it down to uh to um to wood but in your case you're just gonna lightly sand it you don't i don't think you're gonna need to put any true oil on it once you put it satin it feels a lot better but the other thing is you can also do before you even do any of that is if you want to try it you can use some uh, mcguire's uh to polish the neck anything without pumice in it and that stuff uh, uh that was a, a ron thorn trick that he uh, did in a video with us and and i tried it and it was it's really nice it literally makes the neck feel like slippery butter it's awesome so it's worth tracking out so that i mean it was, and it took five it takes five seconds and the stuff costs like 10 bucks so there's that but like i said sanding it's not a huge deal i've sanded a ton of my necks uh just lightly do that it's not even it's not difficult at all so uh let's see uh we got facility felicity facility felicity <laughs> i'd like to say i'm going blind but nope i think that was something else <laughs> felicity says hey phil what are your thoughts on the gibson tony, tony iomi pickups uh they are not as easy to find nowadays yeah you know it was a strange thing they used to be a heavy product that gibson promoted really hard um i've probably tried them once or twice in a guitar obviously when it comes to players like Tony Iommi, you know, he's such, such a classic sound and he has such uh, a, a great tone that, you know, I, I really have learned in my personal opinion that, um, the artists really, the artist products in most cases are the best products. When you take the know-how of a company, like a pickup manufacturer or an, a guitar or an amp manufacturer and take them, the, the ears and, uh, and, uh, tenure of an artist a lot of times you come up with a much better product. So um, other than telling you that I've tried them a couple times and I like them, uh, that's it. Uh, you know, I, I've never felt the need to install many one of my guitars, but if I ever got a Gibson with them in there, I know I'd like it because I liked them when I tried it. Hey, Armando's here. You know, Armando is actually the patron that came with the idea of doing the uh, European friendly time zone. So I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, he says, I might get a secondhand GE 300 for 400 bucks. Good idea, question mark. Great job with the Glary videos. Today, you have been killing it with the published, uh, published videos. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your, uh, your, your kind words on the, on the videos. Um, let's see. Uh, should you get one secondhand for GE 300 for, uh, for, for 400 bucks? Is that a good idea? I, I told you I had the GE 300 uh, and I got rid of it. I have the GE 300 Lite right now. And uh, we talked about this uh, on the Patreon hang about, um, you know, why the video is taking me so long. But I came up with a great concept for a video on that product. And that I started maybe two days ago. So that video, uh, I don't know when it'll come out to the main channel, but I'll make sure I'm under you get it. So you can at least say, I'm, I'm going to be comparing it against the Helix. That's what I decided. And remember when I was talking about, so you guys all are on the same page. I have a G300 Lite more sent me um and uh i'm i like it but i'm not sure i like it more than my helix stomp 
And so I've been trying to figure out how I feel about it. So when I do the video, I know what to articulate, why someone would pick one over the other. And over time, I just come to the conclusion that the only way to do it is just a shootout. So I'm going to do a shootout of those two products and then let you guys know which one I prefer and why. Um, and I don't know the answer yet. That's why I said I started this. Uh, I'm gonna, I got an AV box and I got it all set up and and it, it's going to be a totally different video than I ever did. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be. Uh, very unpolished because <laughs> it's just going to be a compare. I don't know if it's going to be a good review, but it'll be at least something to help me work through it. And maybe you guys will, uh, if you're in those in the market for one of those two products, you'll, you'll, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe it'll help you. Um, let's see. Uh, hold on. Let me find some more comments again. Like I said, if you're talking to me, put the question mark at the beginning. Uh, uh, Aaron wants to know how much do ch do I think uh, chips in the finish affect the price of resale guitars? You know, it's funny. Not very long ago, 15 years ago, uh, ab about which I was about right. 15 years ago, a chip in a guitar was a big deal. If you came into the shop with a Les Paul or a Strat with a chip in it. Um, we would start knocking the price pretty heavily. We'd be like, oh, it's got a little damage here, a little finish crack, a little this, and we start hitting you. And then as Relic guitars got more popular, it's like almost like that stuff just stopped. Eight people start worrying about it. Uh, so like patina, you know, the patina on an instrument's uh, hardware being a little uh, worn or like I said, a couple chips here and there. So here's what I've learned uh, to answer your question. It's, uh, it's not how much does it affect the resale, it's how it affects only certain guitars. So let me give you an example. A PRS with a chip in it is a big deal. It sucks. <laughs> like I said, I've chipped two PRSs I'm like oh, of my own ones. And I'm like, ah, oh, and both times it was like, well, there's $300, $500 lost. You know what I mean? I mean, literally that's what's worth on the resale value. Um, a, a Strat with a chip in it, a mark in it, I mean, it's not even a big deal. In fact, it's gotten so crazy with relics that even dents and necks aren't even a big deal anymore with certain guitars. So it depends on the guitar. Um, so to answer your question, it doesn't affect every guitar, but it does affect guitars. Uh, and usually the rule is, think of it, and I like this analogy, like trucks and Cadillacs. I don't know, I can say cars, but I'm gonna say Cadillacs. If you got a dent in your Cadillac, it doesn't look right. And you're like, ah, you gotta get that fixed, right? And if you're going to sell your Cadillac, somebody's gonna be like, oh, it's got a dent in it. And you can say fancy car, it doesn't matter. A truck though, with some scratches and some dirt and stuff, it's like kind of like, ah, it just means he was using it, right? Or they were using it. So again, guitars work the same way. Guitars that are uh, that are that it sell well being relicked, generally non-relic guitars don't have that much of a problem. But uh, but if it's a fancy guitar, it's uh, the the d chips and dings will hurt for sure. Um, uh, let's see. <laughs> I love it when I go quiet just for a second. It feels like an hour. Okay. Uh, Scott wants to know any thoughts on metal tops. He's talking about like the Zemantis guitars or the guitars that have like have a metal physical metal on the guitars. Uh, I love the way they look. I just don't like heavy guitars. So as long as the guitar is within range. And when I say I don't like heavy guitars, I don't mean I only like light guitars. I just don't like it the guitars when they're overly heavy um, for no particular reason. It's not an issue. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's just, I noticed that when you uh, have a few guitars, if some of them are obnoxiously heavy, you tend not to pick them up and play them as much. So uh, let's see. Um, I love it. I'm, I'm seeing so many new names today, by the way, and a lot of shout outs, Puerto Rico, France. I appreciate it. I saw a bunch of others too. And like I said, if I'm not catching them, I'm sorry guys, but definitely it's cool. It's like I said, it's a, a lot of fresh names. So a different time, different days has been, it's already fun. Ah, hi from Germany. Hi, Matthew. How's it going? So really cool. Ireland. So, uh, and I saw, um, Declan here too. So I know he's here as well. Ah, Scott says, how are you hanging your Kiesel Vader? Magic. Uh, <laughs> so I have a headless Kiesel guitar and um, I don't like that I, I can't hang it. Uh, and I, I have a sideways hanger and I put it on there, but I, uh, you know, I, I didn't like, uh, um, I didn't like hanging that way. So I, I I thought about doing a video showing you guys how I did it, but I don't know if it's something I'd recommend you guys do. So basically what I did is I have uh, 
a leather strap and I mounted it on two furls and then I mounted it in the top of the headstock. I'll, I thought about doing a video about it, but again, I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm really trying to show it to a couple of friends that are machinists that may be able to do something cool with it. But yeah, it's basically a leather strap at the top um, mounted with furls into the base of that plate. Um, I was thinking about just showing you guys right now, but I don't think it would make sense if I didn't like actually do a video taking it apart because I don't know what you'd get from it. But that's how I'm doing it. And I, I think it's something that they should do on headless guitars. And then it's just hooked on a, on a strap. In fact, if you watch a bunch of videos, you'll see sometimes it's on the bottom row. You can see the top of it. And then sometimes you see the time. Um, <laughs> Bam Mazi says, a price for my morals. You know, I don't know. This is a true story. I, uh, I uh, once had somebody ask me that in a weird way, not in this way, but like, in a, you know, like how much do your morals cost? And I said, well, I've never been asked. I've never been offered a hundred grand to do anything wrong. I, I'd like to hear that. <laughs> like, I'd like to go, I'd like somebody to go, I'll give you a hundred grand if you say this is a good guitar. I'm not saying I'm going to do it. I'm just saying that's the time. That's the day I'll be like, give me a minute. Hmm. And so I hope I'm, I'll say no. But uh, what I can tell you, Bam Mazi, the reason why I thought I answered your question is um, I do laugh, and I mean literally laugh out loud every day at how stupid companies are and how is in the world do they think people are selling their morals for what it is I get offered every day to do stupid things. Um, I, I, have, I, I have so many companies that are like, for a hundred bucks, will you do this? Will you 200, 300 dollars, will you do this? And, and you know what laughs is, and I'll tell you this while I tell you the story. You laugh going, 200 dollars to compromise my integrity? Go yourself, right? And what's funny is, is um, most of the time, I don't even respond anymore, I just block them. I block, and it's companies, not people, just companies, constantly companies. You get a lot of this stuff. Um, obviously, once you, I, for me, it was a hundred thousand subscribers. Once I broke a hundred thousand subscribers, all of a sudden, all these weird companies start coming out of the woodwork like crazy, and they just start sending you weird emails. And it's everything from like we review our blender. I mean, there's no logic to it. It's not just guitar companies. I mean, it's just companies. Um, but what's funny about that is this is why I'm telling you the story. One day, telling a story, uh, hanging around the barbecue with some buddies. I mentioned this same thing I'm telling you. And they said, well, how many? And I said, oh, at least once or twice a day. And they said, well, if they're offering you two to $300 a day, that's, that's a lot of money over the year. And I'm like, so we were, I started thinking about going, yeah, it's like 30 grand a year. I'm telling you, I'm saying no to. And then I go, yeah, I mean, I'd have to do a lot of things. And, but so my answer, bam, is that, uh, yeah, I, it's funny. Like to me, I wouldn't do it for a couple hundred bucks. And obviously I won't do it for 30,000. That's where I came up with the hundred. That's where the joke came from the hundred thousand dollars. I said, yeah, I guess I'm saying no. Uh, I can tell you this. I can't brag this year, but I can't, can brag in 2017. I took all the companies I said no to and added up. It was almost $70,000. I said no to. Um, so, you know, I still bring that up. <laughs> to my wife <laughs> i go you know i said no to 70 grand over a year uh of companies because that's what it is companies the the, the companies send you an email it's it's all the time companies send you an email and um luckily for me i'm i'm definitely i was i was uh tenured and smart enough in the business acumen uh when i started my youtube channel to know that nothing is what they say so when they're like hey we'll give you 500 bucks if you mention our thing in your in one of your videos um that's that sounds great right easy money who wouldn't say yes to that but you're smart enough to know that's not how it works right it's going to be i got to say exactly what they want me to say and it's got to be you know a certain way and and then what does it cost me to do that because there's a cost to, to selling your soul not just uh, uh you know the sleepless nights but you know there's almost 700 hanging out here on a live show in the middle of a thursday uh you know, if you if I took a lot of those choices, I don't know if there'd be this many people hanging out with me today. So I don't know. Um, so, yeah. So there you go. There you know. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, it says it's funny seeing Bam Mozzie without a, a wrench. Well, let's fix that. Hold on. I can do that, right? It just takes a second. He's got a wrench. <laughs> Poo Ninja, do you want a wrench? <laughs> you know what? Where's it? Where did Poo Ninja go? Ah, I, um, 
If you guys don't know what the wrenches are, um, basically people who frequent uh, live shows uh, and, and feel like uh, they're trusted. In other words, I, you know, I know the name, I know the person, I've seen them comment a lot. Um, you can give them a wrench and it allows them to do certain things like block people or put people in timeout and stuff if uh, people are putting crazy stuff, as, as sometimes they do. But um, uh, so the... Uh, Hold on. Uh, but luckily for me, uh, half the time, um, I can't see half the crazy stuff you guys are putting. <laughs> I'm too busy looking for questions. Uh, okay, hold on a second. I got to jump over because, again, I got a lot of Super Chats uh, piling up. I say a lot, but it seems like a lot. All right, ready? Where do we leave off? We left off with uh, with Punk Ash. <laughs> what a great name. Uh, uh, Punk, Punk Ash said, morning, Phil. It is morning. It literally is morning where I'm at right now. Thank you. Uh, it says, uh, great Thursday so far. Live show and finally get to some guitar time this week before work. Hoping to have my Super Strat done in the next week. Thanks for everything, and you have a great day. That's awesome. Uh, that's uh, really cool. I'm excited, too. You guys notice that everybody's trying to finish up the unfinished uh, guitar, great guitar build-off right now. And uh, they put an article on Guitar World about the Texas Toast guitar, the hater maker, which I thought was really cool. Give them guys some definitely credit for for making the crazy three neck guitar that won. Like I said, uh, uh, I, I think that event. I don't know if I've shared this with you guys. I think that event. I've heard. I think Dan at Guns Guitars said it. He was happy with the way everything had came out, and when he was talking about that, I felt the same way. I kind of wanted Texas Toast to win. Because, like I said, the guitar was so over the top. It was so crazy. And they put so much damn effort into this thing. It just didn't seem like, you know, not that everybody didn't put a lot of effort in. But you understand. They went, they they brought it. <laughs> right? They were definitely bringing the A game. And all I really wanted was to not be dead last. Um, and, you know, you hate to say that, you know, because, you know, because everybody had a valid uh, guitar, but you know, you just don't want to be dead, dead last. And that's, and so, like I said, that was really cool. So it came out really good. I wasn't dead last and, uh, and the charity thing worked out. I don't know if I told you, um, I, I don't want to be too early on this, but, uh, as you know, the guitar sold for 46, uh, $4,650. Uh, the person who bought it, uh, did the official review on it and, uh, or, you know, wrote me a review, uh, didn't do a video review and, uh, loves the guitar. And I, I shared that on Facebook. It was a really, really like really great review. <laughs> really made me feel really good about all the work we put into it. Um, but the, the cool thing is, um, I have a, I told you I have a viewer who wanted to buy it and he wanted to pay $6,000 for it. Long story short, he sent me a message the other day that he's going to try and donate the difference, the the $1,400 of what it got to what it was going to be for $6,000. So that's not official yet, but that's what he was saying. So um, so I'm going to talk to him some more about that. And uh, that'll be cool. Uh, Grumpy Mike Guitar said, listening while I work, and why not? Of course, man. Of course, why not? Um, thank you, Grumpy Mike. Uh, it says, a uh, guy says, hey, Phil, I'm, uh, oh, it jumped. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm new to bass. Just got a player series P bass. Is there anything you would change in the bass or mod? Well, yeah, I would put those relentless pickups in them. These things. This this I, I uh, there's a trick. If you guys, if you, any of you guys hadn't seen that video I put out yesterday, I know it's a bass video, and I know that people don't watch the bass videos on the channel as much as guitar videos. Um, and I always try to slant my bass videos towards guitar players. I don't know if you guys know that. I always make every bass video I've done has been a video where it's like, if you're a guitar player and you do a little bass, this will help you. Or if you're going to try, this is going to help you. Um, so I did a mini P bass from Squire, which was awesome. But um, I'm going to tell you a little secret. In the video, in that video, um, it, the uh, obviously I'm doing my slap technique and I'm doing some chord stuff and I did some looping but there's a very interesting thing at the beginning of that video when I show the pickup and I'm playing kind of fast with my fingers I can't do that <laughs> I don't know why I didn't put that in the video um I can't, that technique that I did, I just did that in that video. I had never done that before. It was definitely because of those pickups. I don't mean the way they sound. You'll see the video, the way they work, the ramping system worked. It literally worked. It made it to where I could glide over the strings faster and pull off some of those. Uh, I would call what I, that, what I did, what I did in that video for that lick is what I would call a baby Billy Sheehan lick. 
Like I, it's my sad, pathetic attempt to even try to do something that he does. I mean, that guy with his fingers is just a superhuman player for sure. But uh, that was my little homage to him. But literally I, I did it because in the video, I wasn't even thinking, I was just trying to demo the pickup <laughs> and I did it. And I was, and I think if you watch my face, there's a little bit of like, what the hell's going on? I'm doing it. <laughs> I don't know if you guys ever had that experience. You ever had, uh, ever picked up an instrument? You know, when people say gear doesn't make the musician, but every once in a while you pick up a piece of gear or plug into a piece of gear and all of a sudden things come out of your fingers and your mind that didn't exist before. I've had that happen. And it's, it's a very, in fact, it's so awesome. I think that's sometimes why we get addicted to buying more gear is to try to recreate that hit where I'm like, wow, all of a sudden I couldn't do this thing and I could, but so, guy, I would definitely check them out. They're 109 bucks, and uh, I, 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 like I said, I, I really, really like them. I really like them. They were, they were, they were way, they were way better than I ever predicted, and uh, and they really made that bass come alive. <laughs> I don't know why I should have done it. I had the, I have the footage of the original bass pickups in that bass, but they sounded so bad that even though that would have made the Billy Sheehan uh, Relentless pickup sound even better, it just seemed so made the squire seem so sad <laughs> it was so muddy that all the chords just sounded like mud um compared to uh those better pickups so yeah definitely go with those pickups and they're fast to install i installed mine like i said in five ten minutes um i i was gonna f uh film it but my shop is in total destruction disarray right now it's chaos and you'll see because I, I have a new three camera gopro rig with camera switching system for repair videos that and a new setup and that's all coming and um probably about two more weeks before it's done maybe a month so we'll see but it's a it's going to be a crazy month to get through um let's see carl says what's carl say carl says uh sent my pictures from my build can't wait to see your super strat builds rule thank you carl i have a bazillion pictures. So you know, um, I had to go in and, and set my phone to not tell me when Ask New Gear uh, emails come in because it chimes almost every minute. I've gotten so many of these build pictures, but and I was I was getting a little nervous because I like, like how am I going to share all these? But like I said, if you haven't heard, I'm going to do next month in November two one hour not not these shows. I'm still doing these shows. Two one hour additional live shows. Uh, and uh, if you ever seen Pixie's live shows where he shares photos, you know, from trips, it's great. Uh, it, it does a montage of pictures. That's what I'm going to do. It's just me going through all your guys' pictures and talking about them and uh, and uh, and showing them because it has been addicting. I, I The other night, well, I say the other night, it's like, I don't know, it's Thursday. Uh, last weekend, I was sitting with some friends and we were literally just going through them for hours. <laughs> They're really good. Uh, the Convert says, hey, Phil, I always, uh, wait. I always love Lindsey Buckingham's uh, playing. Have you ever played a Rick Turner model? I haven't. I don't think I ever have. But I mean, obviously, Lindsey Buckingham is amazing. Um, no, I've never. Sadly enough, I've never tried one. So uh, it's nothing that's been never. I don't even think I've ever worked one on one or had a customer with one either. So uh, let me go back to the non super chats and. Uh, Uh, the Asian redneck, weirdest name, uh, the Asian redneck says fret buzz on open strings with a locking nut aside from filling the frets down, filing the frets down. Is there any other way to fix it? Yeah. What you want to do is you may want to take some measurements first, but I would just recommend doing this first on the locking nut, the actual mechanism, the, the, uh, nut piece. Um, they make shims. They're like 25 to $30. They're metal shims. You can make them. You can make them out. Let me put it this way. You got some 10 snips and a Pepsi can. You can literally make them out of that. <laughs> Just cut a square square out of that stuff. But you can use a business card. It's 0.1 millimeters thick is the actual uh, Floyd Rose shims. Um, and so you may need to shim the nut up. And, and if you um, take the nut off and see their shims there, um, it just means maybe more shims or like I said, take those out and use a thicker shim. But yeah, you want to shim the nut up first. That's what I would recommend. And they make two different kinds. They make a, a shim that goes the length of the nut. It's almost like it's got little cutouts for the screws to go through. And then it's it just goes in the whole thing. Or they make little 
portion ones like halves. A lot of times you might find where somebody just cuts them. I've cut, you know, the long ones, cut them in the middle and just use one side again, because you may not have the buzzing on all six strings. Maybe it's just the high strings or low strings, but that's, that's what I would do. Shim that up. Um, before you make a $30 purchase though, what I would recommend is loosen the strings, unlock that. There's usually either two, two Allen uh, nuts from the back compressing the, the uh, nut down or two screws from the top pushing it down. Either way, take those out, lift it up, business card, definitely stick a piece of business card in there. Fixes the problem, buy the right shim if you want, go that route. Um, there you go, super fix. It's real common, that's why they make shims. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't make the shims if it wasn't a, a common issue. Uh, you're the third person I've talked to this week <laughs> with that exact issue. So there you go. Um, uh, let's see. A uh, couple, th a couple of you guys thanking me uh, for doing the European time zone. I like Zen. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you for the idea. That was fun. Poon Ninja says, I put layers of aluminum tape under mine. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, it's good. I, that's a good recommendation, uh, Poon Ninja. Uh, like I said, uh, I find people, in my opinion, overcomplicate shims. <laughs> uh, right? Like, as it always seems to be. So, if you have seen, if you, if you ever have the luxury, and again, you don't have to be a uh, guitar tech. If you just worked in music stores for any time, even a summer, you're going to, you're a person who's already seen at least 30 different ways to shim a neck. The most popular way I've ever seen sh shimming necks, shimming anything is pieces of sandpaper. That's the most common thing. Factories do it. So like I said, it, it's there's a ton of ways to do this. People come up with crazy ideas all the time. Uh, and then people come up with fixed, you know, kind of, you know, like, like how Stu Mac has those wood ones. And then of course, you know, Floyd Rose has metal ones. Uh, there's different kinds of ways to do it. Um, me, uh, you know, uh, I, I use, uh, I use whatever makes the customer most comfortable <laughs> is what I use. Um, but for me personally, uh, I'll stick a business card. I don't care <laughs> if it works. It works. There's no way I'm not, I'm, there's no way, um, somebody's going to pick up my guitar one day and go, I don't know. It's kind of, kind of got a, like a business card tone to it. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> so, so. It's great. You know, actually, on a side note, I should actually say this, this is cool. And a thank you. When I got to meet Ron Thorne uh, in Germany last year, and, and I did the video with what what uh, Squire would a master builder uh, use, I was really excited. I, I almost tackled Ron Thorne the first day, so you guys know. Because Ron Thorne from Thorne Guitar. See, you guys know him. If you know the video, you know him from for being a Fender master builder because that's what he does now. But Ron Thorne has done everything he's done dragon inlays for guitars. He's done swirl paint jobs for Ibanez. He's built Ron Thorne guitars. I mean, this is a guy's in the industry. He's a, he's a who's who of, of master luthiers, uh, with, with no, and, and no ego. So, I mean, it was just great, but he gave me his business card and it was a piece of wood. It was th a thin piece of wood. I say paper, but it was like paper, thin piece of wood. And, um, and I was excited, right? So I got his business card. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the funny story about it is it's now like half the thickness because I've used it for so many shims now because I figured out like that was the perfect, th his, like his business card is the perfect shim for things. Like, because it's like the thickness of paper, but it was actual a sheet of wood, right? So my Ron Thorne, so, if, so sometimes some of my guitars got a little Ron Thorne tone in them. <laughs> there you go. There's my... <laughs> I should send him an email. Be like, hey, Ron, how you doing? Got any more business cards you can send me? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> I'm having too much fun. Uh, yeah, see, Frank Carr says, Frank Carr, by the way, C-A-R-R, -R, like the amps. That's a cool last name. If I was, if my last name was Carr with C-A-R-R, -R, I'd have one of those amps. I used to have a Mercury uh, amp, and it was, it was one of the best amps I ever played. Uh, and uh, it's one of those amps, unfortunately, that you buy it. And if you sell it, you can't buy it again because they're just worth way more than what you sold yours for. And it's got to pay up more to get the next one. But uh, anyways, he says, you need vintage tone cardboard from the 50s for shim. See, you know, what's funny is you, this is a joke we make now on a podcast. Two years from now, it'll be a thing we'll have to discuss because it'll be like, oh, do you see what they're doing? You use... 1950s baseball cards for shims to get 50s tone. Yeah, it'll be something silly like that, right? They'll find some old stock something. 
and <laughs> and say it and say it matters. So uh let's see. Okay. Uh I I I'm it's a little bit Oh, okay. So I just saw I saw a question, but it was actually a resp it was long, but it was to somebody else. So no question mark first for me. Okay. So you know what's cool about doing this live show right now is that a lot of you guys are super chatting me in strange currencies. When I say strange, different than what I'm used to. So it's not strange per se. And so it's like a million dollars. Oh, wait, it's a million, whatever those are. So uh, it's cool because I'm like, I don't know what it's like. I don't, it's a mystery. I don't know. You give me a dollar, you give me $50. I don't know what's going on here. It's kind of cool. And I've had that happen before. One time I got 2000 something and me and Ralph looked it up and it was like 425. And we were like, oh, it was really cool when we thought it was 2000. <laughs> it was cool at 425 too, by the way. I don't want to, I don't want to disparage anything. Uh, Andy says, uh, what are your thoughts on the pod go for a bedroom and then pandemic ends church player? Never like playing my katana through headphones, uh, kids sleeping. Uh, I, I, like I said, I still haven't officially tried the pod go. I was told uh, at the NAMM show by the line six guys that the pod go uses the, some of the, the same, uh, engine for the effects as the helix but not the same modeling because it doesn't do the same modeling as the helix i really like the helix stomp it's a great product so uh i understand the pod goes less the question i would just pose to you andy is always a reminder that there is used product so i don't know personally i want to review a pod go let's be honest if if they sent me a pod go i would definitely do a video i know you guys would watch it and i would definitely do a comparison of my helix stomp because i like my helix stomp um but i have a helix stomp um, if I didn't have a Helix Stomp and I was looking at the Pod Go, I and I couldn't compare them like you, and I don't have you know any insight to give you. I I would probably buy a used Helix Stomp. That's that's just my thought because that thing is just a great little product. I haven't tried the new Boss one. Um, I'm not unfortunately not gonna. I don't have hookups with the Boss guys. There's no, no, Boss doesn't. Um, you know, you, you can see if you can't figure it out on YouTube, some companies just really like certain channels and they just work with them. And there's nothing wrong with that. I have a couple of companies that like working with me. So I, I like that too. It's always nice. Um, so you, you build relationships. Remember, companies are people and you build relationships with people. So they, sometimes they like your content or they like the way you do business. That actually is probably the bigger... Uh, the bigger secret that you guys don't know about. Everybody's like out there going, oh, this is the evilness of what's going on. But a lot of it is just, it, it's not that a, a channel uh, likes a product. It, they probably like the person. So there's a company uh, just recently that I loved the, the person that worked there and they just left. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm not gonna work with that company anymore, but like, let's just say I'm never reaching out to them because the, the person I like talking to isn't there anymore. Um, let's see. Uh, Hope I'm saying it right. It's Marson says, hey, Phil, new music man, 2020 Luke, humbucker, humbucker, or use 2009 Luke 2 for half the money. Is the new one worth the premium? Um, well, worth worth would be, uh, it would have to be decided by you. In other words, uh, I'm actually in the same situation. So uh, let me relate to, to you and maybe this will help. I'm looking at an amplifier right now and knew this amplifier is $2,000 and it's crazy expensive, right? Um, and I can find one used for 13. So that's $700 less. And there's a feature on the new one that is different than the old one. So I, I have been pinned them both. I've been hemming and hawing over it for a few days. And here's what's going to happen. I think if I... I think I'm going to buy the used one because deep down, here's what it is. Um, I like when you buy exactly what you want. You always feel like you, like you got what you, exactly what you want. So if you really want the 2020 Luke, you should do it. However, if you're not in love with that, and that's the problem with this, I'm not in I'm not in love with this amp. It's to the point where I know the 2020, the new amp is going to be the right thing. I think I'm going to go used. Going used is safe, uh, and that's why. Here's why I'm saying this. Okay, let me let me walk you down the road. Going used is always safe because it is very hard to lose money on used gear. Um, and when I say lose money, even with, uh, you know, because we know how it works. Let's say you buy something for $500. You buy something for $500 after sales tax and 
uh, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, let's say 550. Let's keep life easy. 550. And then if you go to sell it, even if you sell it for 550 after you, you know, you, you don't obviously don't get the sales tax and uh, you also have fees and stuff, you lose a little money, but it is always minor amounts of money in the, in the long, uh, long, you know, in the, in the long run. Um, so there's never a bad time, a bad thing about buying a used piece of gear. So I would, I would, I always lean towards used gear. Most of the instruments I have are used. So, you know, um, and that's why I advocate used gear as much as I can on the channel. You know what I mean? There's just that way. It's just a, it's just cause it's good. It's a, it's one of the benefits of what we get to do and as musicians, lots of good used gear. So I would consider used gear. I'm considering that used amp. Um, as long as I know it's been taken care of, which I think it has been. Uh, Brian says, if you have three guitars with scratchy output jacks, okay. Am I doing something wrong as a player or is that considered where an aware item? Uh, no, it's probably, uh, literally dirt. You're probably like, I live in the desert, as I always say all the time on the channel. And, uh, there's dirt everywhere. Um, I once did a video once somebody was like, Hey, your guitar, you haven't played it while well, it's got dust on it. I'm like, that's like two days here. <laughs> it's a dusty place. We have dirt storms. Uh, so no, it's, uh, it's a, it's probably just dust, man. You're getting dust in your stuff. So, uh, scratchy, uh, I mean, you're saying scratchy output jacks. I, I bet you it's more scratchy pots. Uh, but either way you can shoot some contact cleaner in there and, uh, and, and, and do that. I use Deoxit. There is, I like Deoxit. I swear by a Deoxit. However, uh, if you want to save some money, you go down to the auto zone and you just get the, uh, the electrical contact cleaner. It, it works good enough <laughs> for half the price. It's good enough. I mean, the Deoxit for some reason, I just like the three, the three, uh, controllable, you know, you can shoot a lot, a little, or, and, and I like the, just, I seem to have better results with it. But again, a lot of times I'm working on somebody else's guitar. So I want them to have the best experience. So I don't want to use the, the, the cheaper contact cleaner, but for Brian, uh, what I would suggest to you is go get some, uh, some inexpensive contact cleaner, shoot everything out. Can't hurt the stuff. Brian Walper did a great video. <laughs> I loved it, uh, where I don't know what video it was, but he was just squirting this insane amount of stuff into a pedal and just letting it pour out. He's like, he's like, see, it won't hurt it. I thought it was great. I, I always have been, I always don't squirt that much into it. So when he did that, I was like, well, he builds pedals. He would know. <laughs> so it was cool. So there you go. Just go in there and clean everything out. Joseph says, Hey Phil, I'm considering trading my Ernie Ball Music Man Sterling towards a Made in Mexico EVH special. What is your thoughts on trading a USA guitar for a Made in Mexico guitar? I don't think there's any issues there in the in 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 quality, but there is definitely issues there in in value. Um, you know, I, I always have this argument especially on this channel, whenever I mention like, oh, it's made in the USA. And then I get comments like, oh, USA guitars don't mean it's good. Uh, hell yeah, it doesn't mean it's good. The The point is they're valuable. <laughs> the reason they're valuable is because there's less of them and there's continual to be less of them. There will be less American made guitars uh, 20 years from now than there is now. There's less American made guitars probably now than there was 20 years ago um, in the grand scheme of things, right? the import markets are going to win. We see things can change. Everything can change. We're not going off of what we don't know. We're going off of what we've seen. What we've seen is the entire TV industry go import. Uh, we've seen the entire phone industry, <laughs> right? It's import. Uh, import being obviously imported into Europe and the USA. And, we're, and, and that's where Europe and USA are kind of alike, where a lot of it we know is going to the Asian markets. And that's where it's China, Indonesia, Korea, all that stuff and, and bring it in. So the point is, is that that's what's bringing up the value of, let's say, made in America guitars and made in Japan guitars and made in Germany guitars, made in England guitars, um, is that there's less of them. And that's what makes stuff expensive is not only how good it is because how good something's made is a value point but let's be honest a large point of expense of a guitar is availability case in point a john mayer guitar is two grand you slap purple on it it and only make 500 of them now it's worth five grand that's because there's only 500 not because purple is the most expensive paint on the planet earth right so we know that availability is what drives uh pricing because the less available, then people have to pay more to get it, to be in that list. 
So um, you are you are going to be in that and then that thing, if you sell your American made guitar and get a made Mexico guitar, um, that's the only thing that's going to hurt you is the music man will continue to go up. I think the the made Mexico guitars will continue to go up, but, but that's not the only thing you should consider. I'm just giving you that because it's called know your gear and it's a channel about gear. And so part of gear is value. We talk about value. I don't let that always drive my decisions. So, you know, um, it's just, I, I, if I like it, I get it. That's what it is. If you like it, you get it. You won't regret it. If you really want it and you like it, you won't regret it. Ken Solo says, don't forget to hit the like button, please. While I sip some water, hit that like button. Um, uh, I, I can't say it. Tura, Tura Marvar. It just, I'm missing it, but we'll get the idea, right? Okay, so it says, hey, Phil, I'm a lefty and I sadly can't try some of the guitars before buying them. How would you compare the necks and feel of a PRS SE custom with a PRS Core custom? It's very easy. E e the SE neck is much smaller. It's going to be smaller uh, in the way it feels. It's gonna be a much smaller neck, um, considerable to the point where you notice it. Um, in fact, I've I've heard I've had this happen so many times where people tell me they play SE Custom 24s, and they go to play the Paul Reed Smith uh, Core cu Custom 24, even the pattern thin neck, and they're like, "Man, this neck's not chunky, but just so much thicker and different." I I agree. So that's it. It's a faster neck. I actually think I prefer the uh, Core neck. That's the, the the pattern thin neck. I prefer over the SE uh, Custom neck, thin neck, the wide thin. I prefer that. However, um, I really like the SE neck because it's smaller. I just, um, I just find like the 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 PRS core neck is closer to the Fender Strat neck, and that's where I usually like my. To me, an ideal neck for me is a Fender American Strat neck. When you pick up, if you've ever picked up a Fender American Strat or a Fender Mexican Strat, and you play that. That's generally where if the neck's kind of like that, I'm I'm in love. Like it's not too thick, it's not too thin. You know what I mean? It's just kind of right there. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dale Palmer says, if the economy tanks and the prices come down, I'll be buying. Dale, I, I don't, I, you know, again, we're all going to speculate and guess. I don't, I don't think the economy has to tank. I personally think What's going to happen, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I think what's going to happen is we're going to get next year, it's going to be the opposite of this year. It's going to be a flood of tons of used gear. Um, I, I've said this before, the industry as a whole, from everything I've seen online, whether it be articles or, uh, and, or YouTube videos is, wow, everyone because of COVID is taking up guitar and that's what's sucking up all the guitars. I personally don't believe that. I believe we are getting a huge influx of new guitar players, but in my experience, new guitar players buy really inexpensive starter guitars. That's what they buy. If I was going to bet the bulk of the people who started playing guitar because of COVID being trapped in an apartment or house and saying, okay, I'm going to take up guitar, bought their guitars from Amazon. That's what I believe. Again, this is my gut instinct. So we'll have to see in a year how close we are. So this is what? This is October. So by next October, we'll have a discussion about this. What I think's happening is bored people that didn't get hit financially. Okay. So you got to understand there's a couple things going on. Not only do some people not lose their job right now, but some people are working from home, which means a good example. Think about this. Imagine right now, and everybody's in different situations, but I want you to imagine a type of customer for a second. I want you to imagine somebody who's at home, who's financially making the same they were in 2019, but they're not spending any money on gas because they're not driving to work. They're working from home. They literally are getting an insurance deduction of 10 to 15% on their insurance because insurance companies, my insurance company gave me a deduction because we're not driving anywhere. And then on top of that, they're buying all their food and eating at home if you guys, everyone knows if you go out, not only is food expensive to go out, 
drinks. If you go out drinking, if you just go out and get a couple beers and a burger somewhere, two beers cost what a 12 pack does in the United States. Okay. So, so people are not spending as much of cost, their, their home cost, right? Um, where I live, the only thing went up is, and, and where I live is air conditioning. People were running the air conditioning a little harder, but ultimately people were not spending as much. And if you're making the same, that means you have more disposable income. Plus, of course, our, in the United States, the government flooded the market with some money. So my point is, I don't think that a bunch of beginners just soaked up all the guitars. I think everyone nuts, and I mean everyone like 600, 761 of us, a big percentage of you are the, with me, are the problem. I don't know if it's a problem, but we're going to say a problem. You bought extra stuff. You bought more guitars. I've seen it. Almost every friend I know bought four or five guitars during the last five, six months. It's just crazy. Um, we all were doing it because you're like, ah, oh, what else can I do? I'll buy a pedal. I'll buy an amp. Um, you know, uh, so, so anyways, my point is uh, that what I think is going to happen is at some point, uh, we'll get to go back outside and, uh, you know, maybe go on a vacation or something happens and then maybe purge some of this stuff. And that's what I think is going to happen. Everybody's going to purge a little bit. So, uh, and, and I, and I think that's, and I think that's the case now. Um, and like Declan just said guilty as charged and Declan, I thought I just read today that in Dublin, they're like, re, they just locked down Dublin again. Right. So, um, so, so, I mean, obviously we know we're a little way from, from getting over all this, whatever this is. Again, we try not to make that, you know, this is a guitar channel. I'm trying not to be a, let's talk about, talk about anything that's not guitar related, but again, I think there's going to be, yeah, a surplus of used gear soon. Um, soon being within the next year, or maybe, maybe it takes two years. I don't know, but it will, it will come back around because again, <laughs> here's what happens when you collect guitars. I've been collecting guitars for a long time. You guys, sometimes I love when somebody's like, are you going to keep it? You're going to sell it. I never get offended by that question. Of course, that's a, that's what happens when you collect, when you collect anything, whether you collect little, uh, bobbleheads or whatever you collect at some point, you, you beef up the collection and then you hone it down and then you beef it up again and you hone it down. And I've always said this, and I've said this to my son who he, he, um, my son is uh, 21 and he collects manga. If you guys know what manga is, it's a uh, Japanese comic books. He's really into them and collects them. I, I nurture that because I like collecting. And I've said this before because collectors are educated consumers. In other words, they are people that like to spend their money on something they're very informed about. Right. And, and for every bad guitar decision I've ever made, I can tell you, I, what decision I skipped. I didn't buy, I didn't go to the fair and buy a $6,000 jacuzzi on a whim. Okay. And then realize I don't like sitting out in hot water. Um, right. I didn't have that experience. I, 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 and these are real experiences. My friends have had, uh, I didn't buy a jet ski for six grand. That's not worth anything now because, I, and I never went to the lake because I don't like the water. Right. There are things that sometimes I'm at places just like normal people. And I go, yeah, that'd be cool. We should get that. And then I go, yeah, but I, in fact, here's a good example. Um, I once was in a store. I'll never forget this. This is a long time ago. Uh, I was once in a store and I saw a grandfather clock. And I think it was like 1500 bucks. And I saw it and I go, that's really cool. And my wife's like, yeah, isn't that neat? And I go, it's really neat. And my first instinct was maybe we should buy this because, you know, we could have a grandfather clock, clock in our house. And then I thought to myself, man, that's like American Strat. <laughs> And then I thought to myself, man, what's a grandfather clock worth? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's worth nothing because it's like it was a big made in China grandfather clock. I, I, I have no idea. It could be worth a million dollars. I had no idea. I had nothing about know about it. So I skipped that. I don't regret that purchase. Um, it's why I have trouble buying a new TV, right? It's time to get the new TV. It's because I know when I spend $1,000 on a TV, it's worth nothing when I buy it. But if I buy a $1,000 guitar, it's probably worth $1,000 when I'm done with it, especially if I bought it used. So... So, like I said, it, I think we're all collectors um, and we were collect and this COVID thing caused a lot of collectors to get a little bit of just a little bit more aggressive than normal. And I think there'll be a tapering off and that's that's when you you definitely want to to buy. So it, that being said, if you're thinking about selling, you should sell now because people are getting obnoxious prices for stuff. I've sold a bunch of guitars and every single one of my guitars, I got more than what I thought I was going to get very rare. There are very few times in my life where consistently I can put up five things on reverb and get more than I thought I was going to get on every single one of them, much less one of them. So 
<laughs> Michael says, hi. He says, uh, I just drove by a grandfather clock left on the curb. <laughs> See, that's the one I was going to buy. Uh, yeah, Dale says, even Joe Bonamassa show, shops for deals on vintage gear. Well, of course, you know, he calls it Guitar Safari, right? I'm sure that wasn't his, his, uh, you know, his, uh, I don't know if he came up with that idea, but obviously people use it now. And I, I, he was the first person I ever heard that say that. And of course, he's collecting, he's buying, he's selling. It, it's great. Um, you know, I, I, I think I've talked about this before. Um, I want to say 2018. I can look, I just can't look now. I can look, but I can tell you what it was. It was a Magenta uh, American Deluxe Strat. I bought a, a Magenta uh, Magenta American Deluxe Stratocaster, I want to say in 2018. It wasn't 2019 for sure. Um, some of you guys probably remember that. I sold that guitar, by the way. Um, I bought it from Wilcut Guitars. And, uh, and here's why I'm mentioning that. I bought that guitar. My wife was on vacation. I bought that guitar and my wife got the email that, um, you know, that the, the bank's like, Hey, you somebody's using your card. <laughs> so they email her and she called me and said, Hey, did you just buy something from will cut guitars? And I said, yeah. And she's like, okay, you know, she's just checking to make sure that it's a legitimate charge. The reason she called me was she goes, you bought it. you like, you bought it with like money, our money. And I'm like, yeah. And so you guys know, this is true. Um, when I bought that guitar, that was the first guitar I had purchased uh, probably in about 10, so 2018, about 10, 15 years, maybe 15 years. So what I mean by that is when I, when I buy and sell guitars, uh, these guitars right here, like these guitars, if I decide to get a new guitar, I'll pick one of these and I sell it. Like I said, I'm th still thinking about selling the nags. Sell the nags, get something else. My wife never sees that. It just kind of churns in my PayPal account, okay? So I'm not kidding when I say I've been collecting for so long that I don't even, I don't spend any of my family's money to buy guitars. Like my my family, me, my wife, and my kids' money. Like I don't take money out of our account. The money I earn repairing guitars, the money I make on YouTube, all this money, I don't buy my own guitars with that money. I, I have no need to. At this point, I've built a collection up. I've, I've lucked out enough times. I've bought uh, a guitar. I have a guitar right now I, I bought for uh, $1,700 and I'm thinking about selling because somebody offered me 5,000 for it and I think I can get six. So you can imagine I'm going to make four grand on the guitar. I'm going to take that money and you know, that's how this swirls. So that's why collecting is sometimes a different thing than why I say collecting is different. Collecting is about exactly that. You buy something on Craigslist, you bought it for $200 because it was a good deal. You play it for a little while, you flip it when you get 600 bucks, you take that 400 bucks, you buy it into, right? So I've been beefing up my collection for years that way. So there you go. So there you go. That's why collecting is different. Trading is good. Trading is always good. So, all right. Uh, Let's see. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on. I get some... <laughs> okay, I got it. I got it. There's a super chat that, um, well, I got to get to it because <laughs> I, I want to share with what it is. And hold on. Let me refresh. And drink water. Drink water. Okay. Um, okay. Armando's got a question. He says, talking bass, I got a Sire M2 TBL. It's beautiful. The Sire stuff is really good. Um, the the thing is, uh, the thing is uh, I wish more companies would reach out to me for bass stuff. As you guys can see, I can do the bass reviews. Um, the problem is I've said like, oh, I won't do the bass reviews. I actually got, uh, I actually got a, a, a dose of reality. I had a bass channel. I won't say which one, uh, but a bass channel reach out to me. We're good friends. And I, they caught on a podcast where I said, I don't like doing bass videos because the views don't do as well. And they said, you know, your bass videos don't do as well as your guitar videos, but they do better than most bass channels. And I'm like, and they go, so you're saying you're not doing great, but you're beating us. And that's what we do. And I'm like, yeah, that's a perspective thing. And I said, thank you for that. And that really changed my perspective. Like, yeah, I should really enjoy the fact that, you know, uh, yeah, that they're doing great. So the question, the problem for bass, and I'll be very clear, uh, I own like four bases. I've said this many times. <laughs> right? I mean, I just got that mini P base. Uh, so with that, I got mini P base. I got my Warwick, which is right there. I got the uh, my custom uh, custom uh, jazz deluxe. I got my Stuham Urge base. There's four. Oh, and now I have and I have my Ibanez um, 
a firma base. So now I have five bases because I got the new mini P base and the mini. And as I got rid of my Mustang Squire base that I loved to get the mini P base. So what's my point to this? I don't collect bases. I play them <laughs> to me. And I don't even play. I have five. I can tell you right now, I just pretty much play the jazz Lux, And then I go to the music man uh, or not music man. I'm sorry. The, uh, the Warwick. Uh, so my point is it's tough for me to buy a base, uh, because I don't collect them like guitars. I can buy it. At least there's, I'm interested in it, do the video. Um, so it, the sire base is what I'm trying to say is every, the ones I picked up were great. I don't want to own one cause I don't want a base at all. But if I was going to own a base, that's definitely one to be on my list. Um, and I thought about reaching out to them. I just don't know. I, I, you know what? I don't reach out to too many companies and I haven't done it in a while. Uh, because I find that when you reach out to the company, uh, first you have to, exp sometimes it sucks cause you have to explain what YouTube is. I mean, I'm not, I know this sounds crazy in 2020 to have to do this, but sometimes you talk to a company and they're like, what do you do? And I go, I make YouTube videos. And they're like, what's that? <laughs> I don't know. It's videos on YouTube. And then you have to explain what you do and the value to them if they want to send a product out. But more importantly, if they do know what YouTube is, a lot of times if you reach out to the companies, you, you don't have the advantage to when a company reaches out to me, it gives me a great advantage to say, okay, yeah, I'm interested in this product and doing it this way. You interested? And they can say yes or no. When you reach out to them, then all of a sudden there's a lot of talk about what are you going to do and what's the video going to be and how is it going to come across? You know what I mean? There's more rules that I don't like. And I, I really don't like uh, not only to be told what to do because uh, I don't handle that at all, but I don't even really handle what I, what's called preview very well. Preview is where you send a video to a company uh, before. In fact, um, I've done two videos this year that you guys never saw because I sent them to preview for companies and they both companies gave me notes. And once I got the notes, I, one video, I got so pissed off. I just deleted the video. I don't even have it anymore. The second one I learned not to do that. I just took it down. <laughs> so I wouldn't do the video and the notes weren't obnoxious. I, I really have to say, I guess I feel like a little prima donna on that. I, I mean, it, I mean, I guess they weren't huge things to ask. I just didn't like the idea that they told me what to say in any form. I'm like, you know, so that's a long way to talk about the, the sire base. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Uh, so uh, Armando, I'm glad you like the sire base. Uh, like I said, hopefully I'll get my hands on one and we'll, I'll do a video once. Uh, Telly Caster, Caster, that's a great name. C-A-T-H-S-T-R, Caster, boy. No, that's great. Uh, it says, Hey, Phil, I, I have a John Mayer. Oh no. JM, uh, Ventera and the, the Colette and I, and the arm keeps working loose and falling in any ideas to stop this. Can you put some glue around the thread? Uh, you shouldn't have to do that. It's a couple things you could do. I, you could use plumber's tape, but always double, triple check. Cause I'm not familiar with those exact systems. Cause I haven't seen one recently, but definitely, I tell uh, over and over again, I'm keep reminding you guys, always, always check for an Allen screw adjustment. It's sometimes it's underneath the plate in the block on the bridge. Sometimes it's on the side. Sometimes it's, there's all kinds of adjustments. Sometimes there's a turn, uh, like a locking nut. A lot of those things have adjustments that you just don't know are there. So either A, look up the manual and make sure to see if it's there or, or, or B, look for it. It's there. Trust me, nine out of 10 times it's there. Um, uh, so it's just, it's sometimes it's hard to see or find. Um, and sometimes they have a clip. There's actually a clip. Some of them have like a metal clip that goes in there and that can get worn out and you can pull that out. And even if it's a brand new guitar, it can be just effective. So, but like I said, look for those adjustments because a lot of times they're there. Uh, Michael says, Hey Phil, thanks for the chance, uh, for the old, wait, thank, thank you for the chance for the old content to catch up, uh, catch you live. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, the old continent. Well, I don't know what is wrong with me today. Let me take a break. <laughs> okay, it says, hey, Phil, thanks for the chance for the old continent. That makes more sense. I was like, what about my old content? I don't get it. Uh, old content to catch, uh, catch you live. Can you recommend a cheap delay pedal with presets? Thinking about the TC Flashback 2 and using the three tone prints as presets. I really, really like the TC Flashback. You can pick one up uh, used. They make, especially since they came out with the, uh, the ones where you pressure push the... Um, the button. Uh, I like the first one better than the second one, which is the pressure uh, control one. So, but uh, yeah, no TC flashback. If you're looking for a great delay with presets, that's one of the ones, especially on the cheap. Uh, you can pick one up uh, sub a hundred bucks used if you look around. 
Uh, then again, I don't know. I haven't looked at the new used market. So like I said, everything's been a little pricey lately. Uh, Gert says, to fill the bass player, how come nobody plays Rickenbacker basses anymore when they are so popular in the 1970s? Well, they're expensive and there's no affordable versions of Rickenbacker, so you're not going to see them in the masses. That that's really the the thing. Plus, it's a, you know, it's a it's a it's an instrument that's really synonymous with types of music. You're not going to see like me, I play slap bass and stuff. A lot of slap bass players out there, you know. Slap bass, slap to bass is like, you know, tapping to guitars and stuff not everybody wants to hear it but everybody likes to do it so <laughs> right uh i call it the ned flanders diddle diddle right right every you guys the simpsons ned flanders every time i go to the nav show i hear ned flanders diddle diddle do diddle diddle do diddle diddle do that's all the guitars and then you go to the bass and it's ned flanders bass and diddle diddle do diddle diddle do <laughs> so it's a diddle diddle so anyways uh my that's my point my point is that uh as musicians as a whole we tend to play crap that no one wants to listen to um <laughs> everybody plays the blues and nobody wants to go watch it everybody plays jazz and everyone nobody wants to go watch that please don't get offended if you're into those music i'm into the music too that's but if you're into jazz if you're into blues if you're into stuff i'm talking about then you know what it's like to sit in a room with 20 guys cr with their arms crossed like this to a half empty broom that's you know so my point is that's what's with uh rickenbackers is that a lot of bass players want to slap bass and do other stuff and and uh but no rick and ba uh, rickenbacker bass uh rickenbacker rickenbacker i think it's rickenbacker i did a video where they told me the official way to say it i think it's rickenbacker yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'd have to look at my own video again. Isn't that sad? Uh, anyways, uh, Rick and Backer, um, to me, you plug that in Ampeg SVT and it's just it's magic tone. Uh, but they're pricey. And like I said, you you got to want that tone. Uh, Cam S says, hey, Phil. Hey, there's me. Uh, last week I bought a Helix Stomp. Do you have any tips for setting up presets or anyone anywhere you look? For them online you know what's crazy about the helix stomp is is my buddy larry mitchell is a artist for axe effects he uses an axe effects unit and uh i've played with him a few times and we've hung out a bunch of times and when we were going through his axe effects i asked him i said hell help me out help me understand these things because i i, I grab a modeler and i'm just immediately just overwhelmed with it. And he basically said, pick a amp. He said, the mistake everybody makes, and I'm paraphrasing, is that everybody's trying to find 50 different tones. He goes, try to find one tone. So he 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 built a, a plexi tone. And I go, oh, I love that sound. So he built a plexi tone on his Axe Effects. So when I got my Helix Stomp, I built one preset. It's a plexi. Then I found a clean pres preset that I liked. I set that, and that is my Helix. That's why when you guys ask for demos on that stuff, it's really tough for me because it's an argument in my head of, do I go through the whole thing of all the presets and share them with you? Even though deep down I'm only using one, <laughs> right? I'm not even using like a, this is my solo version. This is my rhythm version. I literally, I, I'd use the Helix to mimic an amp that I already like. And I sat there and this is what I did. I, I have my, my Princeton, not my Princeton. Sorry. I say Plexi. I hope I'm saying Plexi every time. I mean, Plexi, not Princeton. Uh, I have my Plexi and I dial in a tone I like, and I sat there with Helix and I dial in that tone. And that's how I did it. I go, I go, he's, he's right. You, you find a tone that you like in a real amp. And then I just sat there with the Helix until I found that they sounded really good. And then more importantly, I recorded them both until they got, they both recorded right. In fact, actually at some point the Helix started recording better than the real amp. Um, so I thought they sounded close in real life, but recorded wise, the Helix tends to win. So that's my tips for setting presets. Just pick, uh, pick an amp. Find a preset with an amp and start editing that preset until you dial in what you want. There you go. That's what I did. Um, I I have no idea. Zelko? I'm going to say that. Hopefully the J is silent. Uh, it says, hello from Croatia. How's it going? See? Different different, different uh, time zones when I do it this time of the day. Uh, do you have an opinion on the SWR350 amp? Uh, SWR is the amps that, if you guys know, it's a bass amp line. Uh, stands for Stephen W. Raby, who's the guy who started the amp line. And uh, then Fender bought it, and they currently still own it, but it's shelved. Uh, he goes, I like it, but using a cheap Ashdown 210, any advice for a cab? I play in a Metallica tribute. Um, the SWR350 is a good amp. I liked it. It was, I mean, it's got good tone. The Ashdown stuff's also got good tone. Um, I guess my opinion, you know, as a whole, I liked almost all the SWR stuff. SWR 
I, was the first base amp company in my mind that really came to the market with something to offer against Ampeg. You know what I mean? Ampeg had that rock, the mids, those, you know, the, the, the mid range tone that was just so punchy and good, but SWR had that growl to it, which is nice. So, um, and so to me, actually, when you think of like, as a bass player, when I think of like guitar amps, I think of Marshalls and Mesa boogies and fenders as being these iconic sounds that people, uh, mimic when they do effects processing, right? When they model amps, they're modeling the, the classics to me, SWR is, is classic as Ampeg in that regards. Um, Ashdown, the thing with Ashdown, the only thing that sucks with Ashdown for me is I've only played cheap Ashdown stuff. So sometimes when people ask me what I think, I go, I always reserve myself when I go, well, when a company makes a, a, a big span of instruments or products like Ashdown, high end to low end, and I've only played the low end, I try to go, well, I don't, maybe I shouldn't really talk about them too much. So they're okay, but you know, never been blown away with any of the things I played that were like 200 bucks from them. It's good stuff, just never been blown away. Uh, okay. Leonardo says, Leonardo says, is it worth it to wire an RG 570 with a super switch to have humbuckers and a strat sound or the V7 V8 pickups don't go well, uh, tapped, uh, greetings from Brazil. Uh, no, I think it would totally work. I, I actually hate Ibanez's wiring system. Uh, hate seems like a strong word, right? I shouldn't say that. I feel bad already saying it out loud, but I dislike it very much. Uh, I do not like it. It gets too thin. Their, their weird inner coil thing, all that stuff. I'm just not into that. Um, so I will be very frank and honest with you, Leonardo. I literally take all the guitars like that and I wire them. So they're coil split. So I like humbucker or coil split. I don't like the whole inner coil out of phase in phase, all those weird things where basically all you do is lose your volume and you get that kind of thin funky kind of thing. I find that that's never useful for me. Yeah. Uh, so, so there you go. And, uh, so yeah, uh, five way super switch would be actually, you know what, to be honest with you, RG 570, eh, maybe put a regular switch and just coil split. Uh, like I would just put a push pull coil split, just call that a day on the pickups you want to split. Um, Ooh. Okay. So soy der, I'm going to say soy <laughs> it says, Hey Phil, how are you? I'm fine. DK20, my DK24 won't stay in tune even after lubricating the nut. Any suggestions? Greeting from Switzerland. Love the show. Um, my DK24, which is right there, is, yeah, you guys, I don't know if you know, it used to be black and now it's custom painted. And what's cool about it, I'm going to share it with the video when it's time, but whatever you think you're looking at, it's not that. This camera cannot catch whatever it is. So you can't see it. It's like kind of, right now you're, it's like, uh, what do you call it? It's a, um, I don't know what they call that. I don't know. I can't, I can't remember. It's illusion, but it's not illusion. Uh, what's my point? Uh, I didn't have issues with that uh, guitar staying in tune. Uh, one of my AZs, I have three AZs, two stayed in tune. One did not. Um, here's what you can do. Uh, it, yes, obviously lubricating the nuts a big deal. Make sure the nut slots are cut correctly is a big deal. If you're still having issues, if you want it to free float, um, what I would recommend, I'll put a link in the description because I'll have to look it up. They make a, uh, not a trim setter, which is where a trim, uh, uh, trim setter or, or a bracket where you can block the trim. You can do that just as easy, but they make a, uh, a mechanism that I install on guitars all the time for customers where it's, it pushes back, uh, against the bridge. It's like a, imagine you have the two springs pulling this way. You have another one that pushes the other way that helps set the trim. Um, I get it off of Amazon and it's like 10, 15 bucks. It's a, uh, so something like that would work really good. I feel horrible. In fact, what really sucks was I literally, like I said, I'm changing things up right now. I literally had a, a bag of them, uh, up here this whole time for weeks and I just took them downstairs. So I can't share. I would show you what it looks like. Um, but, uh, so, you know, if you ever want to see one, actually, uh, so if you want Google Steve eyes, Jim, look uh, right. His Jim just, Google Steve Eyes, the back of Steve Eyes gym. Like, look, he uses one. That's what he uses. Um, and then you can find it that way. But I'll put a link when I do the index uh, to it. Uh, let's see. The next one says, a recommendation on an online course that will help me grasp basic theory. Hmm. Uh, you know, sad thing is I haven't tried a whole lot of the courses. Like I said, I've tried Tyler Larson's and I've tried uh, Tim Pierce's. And both were pretty good. I really liked them. Um, what I will tell you is, 
is there there is an argument hold on there is an argument between who can teach it the best way and who is just got the best delivery in other words the personality sometimes the 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 way their tone comes across how they come across um i would say if it was me i would check out tim pierce's and the reason is, is this, as much as I like Tyler and he did, like I said, I've said this before, Tyler's system seems to be constructed a little nicer than Tim's, but here's what Tim, t here's where, here's where you want, if you want to learn music theory, here, here's my suggestion. If you want to learn music theory, find musicians who apply it in a practical way, not in a, in a, in a theoretical way. So in other words, there's two kinds of music theory. Okay. Two types of musicians for theory. Like watch this will really get people. <laughs> I could get some tr trolls going academically based theory type musicians. Okay. These are the ones that literally they're at a concert and they're like, Oh, that's a, this mixed and he's doing this. And they're going to, they start spouting off everything that the person's playing. Okay. And that's great. And they spend a lot of time learning everything you can do. Okay. And uh, that's, that's great. Okay. But, uh, Oh, by the way, Rick Beato would be another great one to check out uh, because because Rick Beato is actually kind of really strange, in my opinion. He's both. And here, hold on. So let me get to the analogy. So there's the academic music theory type musician. OK. And again, there's no bad musician in this scenario. I'm just telling you the two types I've come across over my life. Uh, academic ones will always know all this stuff. They'll want you to learn everything until you can recite it all perfectly. You can see it this way. I have a friend who will not teach his students chords. He teaches people how to build chords. I've seen it in place. I've seen I've seen kids literally taking lessons from him. Literally, he'll just throw out like a bunch of notes and they'll go, these are the chords. And then literally they'll create the chords and it's really cool to watch that. But that's the academic side. I'm not wired that way. If you're wired that way, definitely find musicians who teach that way. Then what I call is the, <laughs> that was the academic. This is the practical side. Practical side is the musician who's trying to find a music theory in a solve a problem way. Okay. <laughs> what I mean by that is they don't want to learn all theory, right? They just want to know enough theory to be helpful. I love analogies. As you guys know, I'm going to use this one right now. If you want to become a master chef, I, I would say go to a master chef and learn everything there is about cooking. Okay. And, 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 and right. That's, that's the theoretical, uh, music theory concept. If you want to learn how to cook Cajun food, find a Cajun chef who teaches you all the rules of Cajun food, or if you want to, you know, whatever food you want to cook, right. Does it make sense? I, there are some chefs that make everything. And then there are some cooks or chefs that make one specific type of food. So, um, Rick Beato again is, is, is both in that he definitely has the academic side. He definitely knows everything, but he also understands the practical side. Tim Pierce, um, is another one. Like I said, he's definitely smart and academical in the idea that he, he, he knows all the music theory, but he is also just going to teach you what you need to apply. And, and that is what I've learned as a, in playing bass, that is the best way to, to learn bass is go, okay, look. If I'm going to play the blues, I'm only going to play in a certain keys and there's a certain things you need to know. And at some point you can keep learning more and more, which is good, but you know, um, it's not as practical. And, and then the great thing about this is, is once you learn all the stuff you need just for your type of genre music, in other words, don't worry about all the music, just worry about your genre that you want to play. Then try to, then try to go out of that range because you'll never improve your music skills if you don't find music outside of your genre you like. So, so there you go. And a couple of the guys right now are, are, are actually also recommending other things besides Rick Beato, like zombie guitar and stuff like that. Like I said, really cool. But, um, but yeah, that definitely I would check out those guys. Cause like I said, it's a practical thing. I, I watched a couple of Rick Beato's uh, music theory videos, uh, and, um, and I enjoyed them. I was actually on a plane and I think like, I binge watched like 10 of them. Um, okay. I'm going to say Litve. By the way, I have no idea what FT means, but I got $4,000 in, or 4,000 FTs. I don't know what 4,000 is, but either, that's crazy. <laughs> it's funny how exchange rates, uh, like I said, I, YouTube never shows me the exchange <laughs> of what it turns into, but you generally get an idea what it is later. Um, it says, uh, says I beat 2000 under what circumstances would you fill holes after mods not in use also not visible mine are under the telly style bridge 
uh, on a solid body electric. Luthiers here in big money land uh, always do. Um, okay, so the, the core of the question is at what point do you, or what circumstances do you fill holes uh, versus when you're just going to cover them up or have the holes exposed? Um, the only time I think you don't fill a hole like a tuning key hole or a bridge hole or anything like that um, is if you think you're going to put the original part back um, because sometimes it's a little tricky to redrill those dowels out um, on the exact same spot. So that's the only time I wouldn't do it is if I thought, okay, I'm putting the new tuners on, but I don't know if I'm keeping this guitar. So maybe the old tuners will go back or the bridge. Um, and if it, if you can't see it, in other words, if something's covering it, I wouldn't even worry about it. It's not going to change anything or do anything. So that's the only time I would actually, uh, and the only time if you've seen my videos, the only time I fill in a hole is if I know I'm going to redrill on top of that hole. Or, uh, I did a sharp max with a tuning key where I filled the holes because aesthetically you could see them and I didn't want them to be seen. So I, I, I shaved them down and, st and stained them. Um, so again, that would be the, the two arguments, whether or not you just want to aesthetically fill them for aesthetics or uh, functionality. You want them to, to redrill them out. Nico says, U.S. Army here in Belgium. Hey, man, how's it going? Says, what are the time? Wait, well, watch all the time. Uh, but tomorrow I have to wake up at zero dark 30. Phil, you know exactly what I mean. LOL, SSG here. Yeah, you know, what's funny is... Um, uh, when I, when I was timed for my re-up, <laughs> I hate telling this story, um, but I'm going to tell you because you, because just because you're here, uh, when I, I went in and they said, good news. <laughs> and I, I don't know if you, any of you that weren't in the service, when anyone says good news to you in the service, there's, there's no good news coming. So <laughs> they're selling you on an idea. They said, good news. Uh, you're going to go to either Korea or Germany. And I was like, oh, good. <laughs> Cause, uh, so I was 63 hotel. So basically, and I, my secondary was recovery. So, uh, to me going to Korea meant digging Hemet's out of the mud, uh, or, or going to Germany meant servicing Hemet's in while people bivouac in the freezing cold. So I wasn't overly excited about that. <laughs> Uh, so there you go. So, uh, but I do regret it. I didn't go to either place. I didn't, I ended up not doing or not re-upping. I ended up uh, going, uh, that's when I went into the reserves and I did, uh, eight years. I did six years reserves or maybe seven, seven years reserves. And then I ended up doing an extra, oh, it was seven. And I did an extra year, um, after nine 11, uh, when nine 11 happened, uh, you know, everybody was like emotional and, uh, I had, I had just, I had just before 9-11, I just got out of active reserves into inactive reserves and I was, I was done. And then I went back and, and signed up active reserves another year and did another year. And then, you know, then after that, I was like, okay, I feel like I, I don't know, just say it was 9-11. It was a hard time to explain to people. It's just, you kind of felt like you needed to do something. So, um, uh, but yeah, uh, I, I regret not going to Germany now. So, or, you know, Korea, but it was, I was thinking I was probably going to go to Germany. All right. Um, let me button this up. We're at the hour and a half mark. So yeah, Brian says, good news, frostbite. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, they, uh, uh, yeah, you know, Nika says, ah, him, it's fun times. Yeah. Yeah, the um, um, it was. <laughs> you know, okay, I'm gonna end. I'm gonna end in the weirdest way today that I've ever ended with a funny army story. Uh, everybody's got army stories that are in the army. Funny stories. This one is because we brought up Hemet. If you don't know what Hemet is, it's a big truck, very big truck. Um, and uh, they use them in the. They use Hemet as a company, and they use them in airports. When you see those big airport fire engines with the right with the big tires, those are also basically Hemets. And Hemets can they can haul things like a flatbed Hemet, or they can have rockets on them. I've never, uh, you know, I didn't work on the ones with had that, but um, you know, you could put all kinds of stuff on them. But essentially, they're like all terrain trucks. You can basically go anywhere with them and haul, you know, gas. They have fuel trucks, um, you know, that are Hemet's. They have water trucks. They have all kinds of stuff. So, so anyways, uh, here's what's funny on the side of a Hemet, you gotta understand the tires are like 500 pounds 
It's no exaggeration. They're like huge tractor tires. And on the side of the Hemet, they have one uh, tire on the side and it has a little crane and the crane, whoops, and the crane grabs the tire and you lower it down. And that's how you lower it down. So essentially one day at a bivouac if, and bivouacs out in the field, uh, we were standing around, which is never a good idea to stand with a gaggle of, of guys in the service. Uh, always, always goof off by yourself because <laughs> if, got, if it was a gaggle of you, you're going to get attention. So what happened was uh, a, a warrant officer came up, a chief warrant officer came up to us and asked what we were doing. And one of the guys said, nothing. He said nothing. Right now, there are some guys and gals that are in the service. I don't care what branch. I don't care if it's in the, uh, in, in European Armed Forces or United States. When somebody comes up in the military and asks what you're doing, no one says nothing, n ever. He said nothing. And he said, why don't you practice changing the tire on this truck? <laughs> so the process that now now the process is like i said we're going to get the crane we're going to hook it up the tire pull the tire out of the side of the truck lower the tire down the ground well guess what these numbskulls did now like i said i watched the whole time it was great i didn't get to get to be a part of this i was doing i actually was kind of doing something so so with two other uh two other specialists i was a specialist so so anyway so what happened was they get on the truck they un they unsecure the tire and they pushed it off and the theory being it was going to fall and flat hit flat like on the ground, right? Um, oh, look, I'll use this as a tire. So here's the tire, and they're gonna push it off the truck, and then it'll go boom, right? And then they're gonna lift it up, roll it over, and they're gonna save themselves a few minutes. I don't know why they decided to do this. I have no idea. So this is what they did. They pushed it off, it bounced, started rolling, and rolled down into a uh, into a little canal. <laughs> that was probably about a, a 12 foot deep canal, maybe 10 feet into this canal. It rolls in the canal, the canal falls over. Now. I don't know if you know this, there's no way for like five dudes can push this tire, like roll it uphill. There's just no way. Okay. So they go get a Humvee. I watched the whole thing. It's great. This is before phone cameras. Like if I had a phone, like we didn't have phones. This is, <laughs> right? This is 95. There's no phones. That, so uh, otherwise I have footage of this. It'd be great. Then they, they take a, a, a winch and they wrap it on the tire and they take the Humvee and they drag the tire up the hill. But as the tire is going up the hill, it's digging into the mud. And as the mud's coming over the tire, eventually, <laughs> eventually <laughs> the Humvee's having trouble pulling this tire. This is why the story is funny. This whole process took about three, four hours, maybe, maybe four and a half, okay? Three, four hours. They finally got the tire back up. At that point, we got to get ready for chow. So they get the tire, they get the train down, they winch it back up and they put it back on the truck. That's what they did. <laughs> they pushed the tire off and put it back on. There you go. Uh, so I don't know what the moral of that story is. The moral of the story is when somebody asks what you're doing, don't say nothing. That's, that's how we're going to leave on that note. That's the story you're going to leave on. Don't ever say nothing. And then uh, I'm just going to button up a, a quick super chat real quick. I saw... A last one real fast and it is um, hold on uh, it is Tigram01 said thanks for the content greetings from uh, Brazil I'm assuming it says Brazil uh, but uh, it's B-R-A-L I'm sure it's Brazil thank you and then it says love eight hate love and hate I'm gonna think a in because it's an a it's in number eight love and hate says just started playing the guitar was given an old school Gibson it says special model on it uh wish me luck have a good one man no no that's great and a great way to start is always on a good guitar like that uh definitely definitely do it some uh some honor by putting putting some hard practice on it um you know it, there's a lot of us to start on some really bad guitars so when you start on a good guitar definitely you're definitely ahead of the game so Good for you. On that note, I'm going to leave you guys. Thank you guys. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. It's like I said, the European edition at a more friendly time zone. I definitely saw a lot of new names. I'd say new faces, but I can kind of barely see the icons. <laughs> I see kind of some of them, some of your avatars and stuff, but mostly new names. I want to thank you all for hanging out. Uh, thank you guys for doing all the thumbs up. 360 thumbs up is always fantastic. I hope you guys have a great day. Look for episode number three of the Sharp Max of my Super Strat. That will be uh, very exciting. And please check out that new Relentless Space video because um, even if you're a guitar player, I think it's going to have something for you to check out. It was a cool video, and I, I really enjoyed it. And on that note, I'm going to let you go. Till next week, uh, thank you guys so much for your time, and uh, know your gear. <laughs>